Hello everyone, this is Tiffany with the Speak Up and Inspire series. I am going to be talking today with Hope about human trafficking. As some of you may know, Mr. Trump, the president, has designated January, or I'm sorry, yes, January, as National Human Trafficking Awareness Month. So we are going to be talking live with Hope herself. Um, she is an advocate and a survivor of human trafficking. We are going to be talking to her live about human trafficking right here with the Speak Up and Inspire series with me, Tiffany. Human trafficking is a worldwide problem. What I would like for those that are going to be watching is for you to post any questions or comments that you have um, throughout the interview with Hope so that we can hopefully address any questions that you have about human trafficking. I highly, highly suggest that you include your family in this discussion because of the simple fact that, excuse me, because trafficking is a widespread problem. It's a problem that affects everyone, not just children, but also um, adults men and boys. So human trafficking is not just a me problem. It's not just a local problem. It is a widespread problem that needs to be addressed. And that is one of the reasons why I hope our president made it National Human Trafficking Awareness Month. It's very important that we know what human trafficking is. And that is why we are going to be speaking to Ms. Hope herself to talk to her about human trafficking in detail and also for her to share her would love for you to tell us, and we will be reading, what does human trafficking mean to you? What is it that you know about human trafficking? Because some people, even though they've heard about it, they only know what they see in the movies. That's it. They really have no clear knowledge about how it affects them, what the statistics are, um, what are the risk factors. And so hopefully we'll be able to cover some of those things today. So we have Miss Hope. Um, that is with us right now. Um, she is going to be joining us here very shortly to talk about her story and her being a survivor of human trafficking. Um, we're also going to define human trafficking, talk about some risk factors, and then talk about what are the things that you need to look out for um, so that you can protect yourself, your family, and your children from being victims of human trafficking. So hello, Ms. Hope, how are you? Hello there, thank you for having me. Hello, everyone. Hello, I hello. I am exhausted today. Today has been one of those. This has been truly a Monday. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was crazy, but I made it through. So um, I'm happy for that. Well, thank you. I'm so happy to have you on and thank you for us doing our test earlier so that we can try different platforms to see what was going to be best for us. So I really appreciate you taking the time before our interview for us to kind of run through things and see what was going to work best for the best for us. So I really appreciate you doing that. Um, we wanted to have you on the show. So I wanted to wel welcome you to, uh, to the live podcast of the Speak Up and Inspire series so that you can share your story with us and we can um, hopefully give some people some information about human trafficking, um, clear up some misconceptions and really define and share some risk factors that have to do with human trafficking as a whole. Um, I think that some people might think that it's just about sex but human trafficking is more than just that. Um, so from your standpoint and from your experiences, can you tell us um, what human trafficking really is? <laughs> human trafficking is anything that you make it. That, that's, just, that's just really it. Because it just depends on the person and what he wants to do with you and how he wants, or her, wants to um, set you up. So human trafficking, you are um, trapped into someone else's um, misery. 
basically misery. Mm -hmm. They are controlling every move, every thought, every everything of you. In human trafficking, for me, and from what I know, and from what other survivors and organizations that I'm working with now, like at Pasco County, you're in just a room or a place where you're locked down. The traffic part come in where different people, mainly men, but I don't put nothing past women nowadays, would come to where you are or whomever have you hostage in whatever room they decide to lock you up in. And they normally um, use their fantasy out on you. Okay. I've had some fan, I had some strange, weird men fantasies was they wanted me to urine on them. They wanted me to, to beat them. They wanted to beat me. They wanted to do all kinds of different things. And it goes on and on and on. What's really rough now is that when I was into sex trafficking and human trafficking, basically the same, it wasn't, they didn't target the kids. They didn't target um, 10 year olds and seven year olds and 13 year olds and 16 year olds. They didn't target, people didn't target them. So now they are using our children because now you have more pedophiles and more widows and more people out there who wants to live an, another life and f see what it feels like to have sex with a 10 year old. Right. Have sex with a um, 13 year old. Mm -hmm. And now it's to the point where the majority of the young people that these pimps be getting, pimps or pimpettes, and I'm going to tell you why I say that. Because I had a pimp. When it started with me, I started off with sex trafficking. And I had a pimp who put me on the street. And there's different language and different um, sayings for everything. Okay. And from, from, I was with that person for so long to the point that they sent me out to hunt. They sent me out to go and get the next female to join the stable. They sent mm -hmm. me out or they may ask me, did I see anybody that need to join? They call the family. Mm -hmm. Like gang members call the gangs an organization. Pimps call the women that stable the family. So, um, and now the way society is set up now with our young people, sometimes it just started the, at home. You have a lot right. of runaways, a lot of foster kids, a lot of kids who just don't feel like they're being loved. They can come from a two family home with doctors in the house or, you know, um, everything is going well, but they missing something. Right. They're missing something and they go out and they look for it. And all it takes is one person to say, girl, you look good. All it takes mm -hmm. for one person to say, you know what? I'm going to take care of you. Because that's all they want to hear. All it takes is one person to blow in their ear or to go buy them a, a pillow from the dollar store. Right. You know, it, it's, 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 really, um, it's really what that person make it. Okay. And now the way things are now it switches up so much. Go ahead. Well, I was going to um, while we're talking about your personal story and your experience was to share um, some research that I found. So you mentioned that human trafficking can be a number of things. So according to the End Slavery Now website, it says that in human trafficking is the recruitment, transportation, transfer, harboring, or receipt of persons by improper means for an improper mm -hmm. purpose, including forced labor or sexual exploitation. Yes. 
Yes. Yeah. So um, there are different forms of human trafficking and you spoke of sex trafficking. So when you were um, in a, a victim of trafficking, was that the only form of trafficking that you experienced or do you feel that you experienced more than one form of trafficking? I experienced more than one form of trafficking. Um, it started with um, sex trafficking, which is which is prostitution, mm-hmm. and um, it went to human trafficking. So um, I remember when <laughs> I remember when um, I was involved with this pimp for probably um, I don't know, close to a year, maybe. And Mm -hmm. um, he said, well, you know what? We're going to take a trip. We're going to New York. And I've never been to New York. And I've always seen things on TV with New York. And I wanted to see the lights. And I I was so excited. I was so excited. Mm -hmm. And he took me shopping. And he bought the fishnet stockings, the big belts, the short skirts, and the hot pants, and all kind of stuff, the long wigs, and you know, all of that, all of that, to to pack up Mm -hmm. and take with me. And I really wanted to go okay. on the strength that it was New York City. So we were, right. um, we were like, I, I, I really don't know how close to New York we were, but I remember stopping at a gas station, one of them little off-brand mom and pop's gas stations, sit off in a cut somewhere, a little like they're going to hang you if you go there. Mm-hmm. And um, we pulled on the side or either the back of the station. And I remember asking, did I need to go to the bathroom or anything? And I believe I did. And then when I came back around that corner, the trunk was open. And he told me that I had to get into the trunk of the car. Mm-hmm. So I um, got into the trunk of the car. Forcefully, he forced me. <laughs> It was it was a battle, um, but fortunately I, I I lost that battle and um, end up in the trunk of the car. I can't remember and don't know how long of a drive it was from where we were to New York City, but I will tell you this: if you locked in the trunk of a car, it seemed like hours and days. I'm sure and it does. Remember, yeah, and I remember getting out of the car, getting out of the truck of the car, he popped the truck open and I was like scared to move because I didn't mm-hmm. know what was getting ready to happen. It was pitch black outside and all I saw was two buildings real close to us. Mm-hmm. In, in New York the buildings are so close together that mm-hmm. if you open up a window and your neighbor in the next building open up a window, you can throw an egg and, mm-hmm. and catch that egg. That's how close that building was. Mm-hmm. And so um, I remember going down some steps and I remember um, going into a room and um, he threw the stuff at me and said he'll be back, you know, get some sleep on on a twin mattress. So I remember I, I, my dates and times is real fragile. I, I can't give you guys exact dates and times, but um, it seemed like he was gone for days. And as a matter of fact, from that day up until this this day, I haven't seen them since. But what happened was I was locked into that room in that basement, in this real small room, like a closet. And uh, mm-hmm. different men was coming in and out for me. Um, I didn't ever leave the building. I didn't leave. I'm not going to say never. Um, it was a long time before I had left. Um, they was feeding me on different burgers and different sandwiches and or fries and different little things. And okay, so were you, was. were you at, you said you were at a restaurant and someone approached you and that's how you were, became into the situation? Did I ever hear that correctly? No, no, no. no. What happened was how I met the guy that was my so-called pimp back then. Mm-hmm. I was at a club. I just okay. got out of a domestic violence relationship. Okay. I was just filed for a divorce. I was okay. seeking for love in all the wrong places. That's the key. That's it. Thank you, Father. That's it right there. I was looking for love in all the wrong places. Okay. The victims look for love in all 
the wrong places. So I was looking for love in all the wrong places. I went to a club and I remember standing against the wall and we did that eye contact thing. So now I'm going to put on a big smile and I done got my stand together. I'm fixing my hair. I'm like, oh my God, he's looking at me. You know, right. um, and one thing led to another. It did take, it was less than a week before I had a gun up on me. And I remember my sister, um, the first or second night when, when I went out on the street, the Hostro is what it's called. When I went out in Cleveland, Ohio on Prospect Avenue, my mm. sister is very well known and my brother is very, very well known and, um, in Ohio. And I remember her coming over and just begging me not to do it and crying and begging me. And oh my God, she, she begged me not to go back, not to do it. And, and she was so strong about it that I blocked it out because I was looking for love. Not knowing my family, I knew my family loved me, but that wasn't the love I wanted at that time. Right. So you met this guy at the club, you went out with him, and then and he would not let you go. Correct. Okay. And that's how you got into the sex trafficking and the human trafficking. Correct. And um mm -hmm. after so long. People saw me on down there on the whole stroll and saw um, different acts and different things that was going on. Um, and I ended up letting my sons, I only had two at that particular time. I have three today. But I ended up letting um, them go on to stay with their dad's mother. Okay. And so I could have um, that time. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I really want to say he talked me into that. To, give it, to giving your children away. To give my children away. Yeah. Okay. So at that point, he had basically total control over your life. At that at that right. point, it was the mental okay. control first. Yes. Right. And that, that was the other thing I wanted to talk about. There are different forms of trafficking, so I want to make note of that. Um, as we continue with your story, there's um, sex trafficking, which we're talking about now. Um, there's domestic servitude. So that's when um, employees are working in private homes um, and they do not have the option to leave. So it's basically like slavery. Person is working for someone um, thinking that they're working for money and they end up working without the option to leave. Um, forced labor, which would also be prostitution and, tra and sex trafficking. Um, child labor, which is forcing children that are underage that should not be working into working and then there's forced marriages you know let, let, let me let me stop you right there if you listen to what you're saying it's all the same they just they just had mm -hmm. to create different names for it there's no mm -hmm. different it's all the same yep it's just I agree like the you. drug dealer when he trafficking the drugs you just they just trafficking humans i don't right. care how they name it how they shape it how they design it what label mm -hmm. they put on it. I don't care how mm -hmm. they want to say because it was a two-year-old or 12-year-old or 20-year-old or 30-year-old or 50-year-old or 60-year-old. It's all still the same. Right. The because it sounds is like, still the same. Yes, because it sounds like that if you are in sex trafficking, then you're working also doing things that you don't want to do. You're being forced to um, do labor that you don't want to do. So it all the it all is encompassed uh, under the same thing, but they are all calling. Well, they have all these different categories, but they all run together, just like with um, domestic violence and sexual assault. That can exactly. also be qualified as human trafficking as well, depending on a, on the degree of it and how it happens and who it happens with. Yes, exactly. And domestic violence, which is um, my first issue and trauma that I was in, you have physical, mental, spiritual, financial. Right. And, mm -hmm. and human trafficking is basically the same thing. They take away mm -hmm. your mental. They take away your spiritual. They take you don't get the finance because um, you go out there, it, it hit your hand. But as soon as it hit your hand, it's going into the next hand. And half the time, it don't even hit your hand because they there to collect it before you even see it. Right, right. And I think it's important to um, to note that 
just because you are a victim of human trafficking does not mean a lot of people they look at the movies and they see a person maybe taken from charlotte north carolina and they're sent over to mexico that doesn't necessarily qualify for human trafficking you can have human trafficking right within the same state um as you know, somebody might be human traffic somebody might be locked up in your on, on your street in your apartment okay. complex okay exactly. you don't you wouldn't know yeah you wouldn't know Yes, yes. So I think that's another important, in, important point to make. Yeah, I mean, I remember in Cleveland when um this man had this um these girls hostage, and I walked past that house every day with my clients. Mm -hmm. I was working at a uh, with um, adolescents, gang bangers, and drug dealers, and different um kids. Let's just put it like that. And, right. and I remember walking past that house every day for almost two years. And then next thing I know, I hear on the news and everything popping up all over the place saying that they were, um, they caught, they was captured and locked in the, in that house for two or three or four years or longer. So yeah. it can be anywhere. It can it be can. right in your room. You wouldn't even know it because that's the, that's the thing you may be with. You're thinking that you're safe and you're okay. Cause you're with family. Here's mm -hmm. the family cookout. Here's the little gathering. All right, everybody's having fun. Everything is going on. What do you see different? What do you see weird about Mary Sue? What do you see weird about Kathy Jane? What do you see weird about Hope Speak? Everything seems to be fast. She's not as hyper as she used to be. She don't smile no more. She don't do the eye contact. He had to tell her what to eat. Now she don't want that to drink. Now he don't want that to do that. You know, it's, it's, it's all of that control because of looking for love in all the wrong places. And once that one person find out that's what we were looking for, that's what we need, it's a done deal. Mm -hmm. It's like you trap into the mafias and you can't get out. Mm -hmm. It's like the like like my son would say that, you know, you in a game, which is they call organizations, and you can't get out unless you did. Some some of us die trying to get out. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times I was hospitalized. How old were you when this happened, where you became a victim, first became a victim of human trafficking? In my early 20s. In your early 20s. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, they say that the human trafficking victims start as young as five, even younger, and they just today. go up from there. And it's really sad. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. And, and, and today, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's more. Um, and, and I think, I'm going to tell you, um, I processed this for years and I and I um did my own therapy on my own stuff for years trying to figure out the why me, the how did I do it, and all this other kind of stuff that we think about, right? One thing I can tell you, um, even though I was in my early twenties, I looked at like a teenager. My I, I never looked my age. Mm -hmm. I always had that certain look about myself. Mm-hmm. You know, so I never looked my age. So a lot of the men that um, were buying me, yes. they probably thought they were buying 17, 18, 19 year olds. Yes. Well, I honestly, human trafficking has been around way before it became public. Um, I know as um, a young girl, I was about 17, 18 years old, and um, I borrowed money from an older gentleman. Um, I think it was to get my car fixed or something like that. Um, he wanted me to pay him on a certain date, and I was not able to pay him. And he asked me to come over, and I went over there, and um, I just remember him telling me to go in the room so that he can talk to me. And I was like, okay, that's fine. He asked me, um, when was I going to pay him back? And I told him that I was getting paid, like it was within a couple days, maybe three days max. Um, and he said, well, um, you can pay me off now. And I didn't know what that meant. And he sent a man in the room with me. And I told him, no, I am not doing that. Um, I don't know. First of all, I don't know this guy. Um, I had never had been intimate with the guy that I borrowed the money from. Um, but he would not let me leave the room because he said that was the way that I was going to pay him back. Um, and I was young. I was scared. I didn't know what to do. Um, and so uh, there was three 
older men. They were all maybe in their thirties. Um, and I, I couldn't leave there. There was, I would not have been able to leave without them hurting me. And mm -hmm. unfortunately that was his way of me paying off my debt, which wasn't even more than $200. Um, but I remember feeling like I, I didn't know what to do. He wouldn't let me go home. Um, even though I was not even five blocks from my parents' house, I, he took my phone from me at that time. Well, not phone, but my pager from me at that time, it was pagers. We didn't have phones. Right. He took that from me and, and he, he wouldn't let me leave. And it was a horrible experience. I was 18 years old. I didn't know what to do. Um, and, so what and did you do? so what did you do? Did you serve him? I, I did. I didn't know what to do because when I told him no, he pushed me on the bed and the one guy took it from me. And when he was done, I asked, I basically cried to him. It was like, that's it. I, I don't owe you anything else. And when I tried to leave, he sent in another guy in there with me and he told me that I wasn't done paying him off. Yeah. And, and that's how it works. And that's, that's exactly how it works. And that's exactly how a lot of these young girls get caught up. Because they know that they can't pay them back or that they need them for something or um, that they want to get high, you know, they want to party or whatever it may be. But in the back of that man's head, he have a bigger plan than what you thought, a bigger yeah. plan than what you thought. And then when you locked up, when you're in that room and there's only one way in and one way out. And they standing at the doorway where you can't get out and you're looking at these strong, big old men and you're like, what the hell? What am I do? There's nothing yeah. you can do. You save yourself. You save your life because, yeah, they would have killed you. And, and, and you know, that was a while back. I'm going to tell you something. If they get caught up now with, the, with certain um, men, they're not going to let you out of their life due to the fact that, one, you can identify them. Two, you'll be called out for rape. Three, it's a whole you you know press the charges get with the police and all of that and they're not gonna in today's world they don't allow that they're gonna kill you before you leave up out of there or they're yeah. gonna keep you as long as they can they're gonna keep you as long yeah. as they can well yeah at the time um i was just coming out of foster care i was in foster care for two years so even though my parents were right down the street i would not they would have been probably the last people that I would have gone to at that time. Um, so the way that I was able to leave is because my pager kept going off. And I told them, I said, my, who was my foster mom and my boyfriend at the time. So they're going to be looking for me. And I basically had to convince them that my boyfriend knew where I was. So I was there for maybe a day and a half. Um, and then my boyfriend did actually start driving up and down the street. He knew I was on that street somewhere. He just didn't know where. Um, and he let me go. And he told me that I still, that I was not finished paying him and that I better come back. Of course, I did not go back. Um, and then maybe a couple of months later, um, there was cops at his house and I never saw him again, thankfully. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't know back then that that was possibly um, human trafficking. It could have qualified for human trafficking. Yeah. Um, all I knew was that it was rape. I did not know that it was human trafficking back then. So I'm sure there's a lot of people even, to, even today that are in situations and they, I mean, just like prostitution, some people might th not think that that's human trafficking. Some people might just think that it's prostitution. They don't know that that's also a form of trafficking. And you're right, because I didn't think it was. I, it, human trafficking mm -hmm. wasn't nowhere on my mind. I, I never really mm -hmm. thought about it. Right. I, yeah. I, it, that kind of stuff wasn't talked about on my street and in my household. Right. So I, I didn't know. And that's why I, I tell people not talk to your kids. Oh, they too young to hear about that. Oh, they too young to do that. So, listen, this is 2019. Not 1999. Talk to your kids. Get them ready and be have them prepared. You need to turn them into so little so because if you don't, and such a weak to the knees, 
kids and they not they don't know what's going on or how to handle themselves or what to say or what to expect or what to look for, you're going to lose them in the system. And I don't mean the system with child protective services. I mean the system of human trafficking, sex trafficking. And they may be right next door, locked up in a room or in a closet, and you posting pictures of them on a, po on a light pole looking for them. Talk to them. Let yeah. your kids know what's really going on. This is a whole different world, baby. These, are whole, these people here are totally different. And that's one of the reasons why um, when I was uh, putting it out there that we were going to be talking to you today, why I said, that please invite your family, not just you yourself or your husband or your partner. Have your children sit with you too, because this is a problem. I have um, a young lady who is in my network of, um, of advocates and her daughter right now is missing. Um, sh she's missing. She was taken from her school and they don't know where she is and it's what, what suspected do you mean human trafficking from her what do you mean taken from her school um, that she um met some guy online um okay. who said that he was one person she was, um ended she up being left, another person. she left from school she left from school yes yes, he yes. Her she did. She did. And meet her there and she got in the car and she left with him yes and now she's now she's gone so we found out that instead of him being 18, he's like 30 something years old. Um, yeah. A whole lot of things are going out. Other girls that he's talked to have come up missing and we don't know where she is. We have no idea where she is. So we have to talk to our girls. I believe she's 16 and no one knows where she is. She's, she's, yeah. she's, she's missing. And it started on the internet, talking to, yeah. to some guy on the internet who who was who looked young, like you said, you were in your twenties, but looked like you were a teenager. This boy looked like he was probably 17, 18. Well, it years was old. it wasn't him. It wasn't him for one. It was probably mm -hmm. another picture of some other kid or someone else that he kept posting and putting up to make it look like he fits her. So it mm -hmm. definitely wasn't him. He did not post his own picture because they don't they do not do that. Mm-hmm. They Google pictures that. or they go on, on into the images and they find these pictures that make, you know, that fit what you may look like and what you may want. Because right. one thing I will say, and please let your kids know, stop sharing all that information online. Yes. Because you're mad at your, your parents or you or something went on or your boyfriend made you mad or whatever. Don't get online and start telling them, I am so mad because she won't let me wear that pink dress. She said it's too short and I like short stuff and she's good on my nerves and I just can't take it. And la, 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 la. Because what's going to happen? You They're set yourself up for trouble. Yeah. 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 Um, I wanted to share some of the risk factors. Um, it said that there are possible risk, risk factors that are associated with child trafficking, but it would also be for adult trafficking as well. Um, some of the risk factors were um, isolation, um, homelessness, poverty, substance abuse, mental illness, um, having a history of child sexual abuse, um, family dysfunction, and lack of social support. Mm -hmm. Do any of those factors, um, were any of those factors um, in your life? No. No. Okay. So what do you feel um, made you vulnerable to becoming a victim? I got married when I was 18. I think I was 18. First time I had sex, I was pregnant. I think I was 17. Mm -hmm. um, got married. You know, I was forced into the marriage. I'm just going to keep it real. Um, because mm -hmm. his parents, he come from a good family, his parents had good jobs and all that kind of stuff like that. So due to all the abuse and uh, the beatings, black guys, broken ribs, fragile skulls, uh, stabs, cuts, all of that for three years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When he, he kept me away from family, friends, uh, when I did try to work at that time, he would come on my job and grab me off my work. It was crazy. So when I finally got out of the domestic violence situation, mm -hmm. I didn't know what to do because I went from 18 to 20, maybe 21 or 22 in, mm -hmm. that, in, in that abuse. So from right. that point on, I didn't know what to do. I mean, 
what happened to playing jacks on the kitchen floor with my sister was gone. I, I had nowhere to go. I did not know what to do. It was like I was brand new on the planet. Right. So you were vulnerable. You were vulnerable. Not only were you um, a victim of domestic violence, but you were isolated from your family and your friends and you were vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I went to the club. Um, I don't know.